This week's cover story, 1975, and a pair of rookies who took Boston by storm. Our styles mixed together very well, and we knew each other, and that helps a lot. We'll travel to the minor leagues where a pitcher finally makes the big time by keeping his mouth open. I thought I could go out and have a great year in baseball and that'll possibly be my chance to be on ESPN, but here I am on ESPN saying Smittyisms. And we'll go around the league where three Tommy John errors on one play is a little hard to swallow. I should have just eaten the ball. That's it, just, just eat it. This is Warner Fusell. Nineteen seventy five, Frank Robinson becomes baseball's first black manager. Nolan Ryan throws the fourth no hitter of his career, while Catfish Hunter becomes one of the first big time free agents. And fresh from Pawtucket in 1975, two rookies earn roster spots on the Boston Red Sox. Fred Lynn and Jim Rice, destined to become one of the most exciting rookie tandems in baseball history. They were a tremendous talent. It didn't take many uh, days on the ball field in spring training of 75 to know that they were going to fit exactly and do what we all needed and wanted them to do. We came on the scene and the ball club wasn't doing that well until we got there and and uh, we did help turn it around, although there was a lot of other talent besides Jimmy and I. These two guys played like they had been around the league for a while. They didn't make rookie mistakes. Uh, a couple. But, but nothing that would stand out that ruin a, a ball game, lose a ball game for you. These guys were, these guys were winners. They won games for us. Watching uh, Lynn play that year was really a lot of fun because uh, when we needed a big hit or a home run, he came through with it. And the same thing with Jimmy. They called them the Gold Dust Twins, and they definitely were to us. They meant a lot to us. Fred Lynn and Jim Rice helped resurrect baseball in Boston. But there was such a good story, the entire nation wanted to share in the enthusiasm they brought to the game in 1975. Lynn hit 331 that year and led the league with 47 doubles and 103 runs scored. Rice hit 309 with 22 home runs and more than 100 RBIs. They complimented established stars like Carl Yastrzemski and Luis Tiant and helped put Boston in the World Series. One manager, Darrell Evans, entered without Rice, whose wrist was broken by a Vern Rule pitch the final week. I don't think he was throwing at me. It was just one of those accidents, one of those things that is going to happen in baseball. And there was nothing that I can do with her. I think everyone wants to, to play in the World Series. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to play in the, my first year in the big leagues in the World Series. I really felt for Jimmy because to work that hard and, and to finally get to a series and then not to get to participate uh, must have been a real blow. So with Rice on the side, the Red Sox took on the big red machine of Cincinnati. Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench, and Pete Rose. It was a series that took on epic proportions as it progressed. With the Red Sox trailing three games to two, the series moved back to Boston, where a relentless rain made tension a formality. Finally, after three days, the players assembled for game six, and it was rookie Fred Lynn who bolstered Boston's hopes with a three-run homer in the first inning. But even with Tiant on the mound, the Big Red Machine came roaring back and led 6-3 to three in the eighth after a leadoff homer by Cesar Geronimo. Boston appeared dead, and then Bernie Carbo. Incredibly, the score was tied at six. Then in the bottom of the 12th, Boston's Carlton Fisk painted an image that would live forever in baseball memory. The 1-0 delivery to Fisk. He swings, long drive, left field. If it stays fair, it's gone. Home run! The Red Sox win! And the series is tied three games apiece. The 
sheer drama of the game helped bring 70 million viewers to their sets for Game 7, which Cincinnati won for its first of two straight World Championships. But in retrospect, it was the sixth game that stood alone as one of the most remarkable ever played. I'll never forget going uh, to the bus that night. Uh, Rose came up and tapped me on the shoulder. I was walking up. He said, wasn't that the greatest game you have ever been in? I told him, Peter Edward, you are crazy. I said, that game there you call the greatest game we've lost. And I said, and I'm not going to sleep tonight. And you say, that's the greatest game. He said, look, I will win tomorrow. But that was the best game I've ever played in. I think it came at a good time because baseball at that time was a little bit down and it needed something, it needed a little spark, and uh, that series gave it the spark. And ever since then, uh, every year has been a new attendance record set, and uh, more people come out to see baseball than ever before. And I think that series uh, helped a great deal. Lost in the hoopla were the fine seasons of Jim Rice and the only man ever to win the MVP and Rookie of the Year awards the same season, Fred Lynn. I didn't really get a chance to enjoy it as much as I should have or could have because everything happened too quickly. Um, and when the awards started coming, um, I just said, well, you know, thanks a lot. And, and they were, I just kind of looked at them. And, and they don't really mean that much to you when you get them. It's, it kind of takes a while. When you put everything away, you go back, not necessarily look at your golden gloves. The other awards are, are good. But by winning uh, eight golden gloves or MVP or Rookie of the Year doesn't mean you'll be in the Hall of Fame. The two rookie sensations of 1975 went on to have outstanding careers. But ironically, today it is Rice, and not the heavily honored Lynn, whose numbers have him knocking on the Hall of Fame door. A lifetime 300 hitter, Rice led the league in homers three times, twice in RBIs. Despite his recent problems in Boston, Jim has given the city a long and productive career. It's been a different story for Lynn, who was traded to California in 1981 and is now with Baltimore. Haunted by nagging injuries, Fred never lived up to the potential he displayed in 1975. I think when Fred left this ballpark, it hurt him. Because uh, he has such tremendous power to left field in this park. This park was built for him. When I got to Fenway, I learned how to hit the ball the other way, and I could do it very effectively. It took me a couple of years to adjust to not playing there. And my average has never been as good as it was at, as it was when I played with the Red Sox. Won eight gold gloves, and I've always said I've always had a great center fielder next to me. And that's what makes the side fielder so good as a great center fielder. Freddie was that to me. He really complimented me as an outfielder, so I hated to see him go. Our styles mixed together very well. And we knew each other, and that helps a lot. I felt that uh, we had we would have had a good career together here playing in Fenway Park, and I didn't want him to go because he knew how I, how I was going to play, different reactions as far as playing left field, as far as playing together because we played all through my leagues together. It would be nice to go out and sit around and, and shoot the ball for a while. It would be fun. Um, although you start to to uh, digress a little bit and you start to say, geez, it wouldn't be nice if we could all get together again and do it, but it doesn't look like that's ever going to happen. But um, it was nice while, while we were there, while it lasted.